right, well, welcome. What a great way to start. Thank you, Naomi. Um, wonderful to see you here on this kind of new holiday weekend that we've got with all of the schools or most of the schools being on fall break this week. There are about 50 more people here than I thought were going to be here. Uh, with everybody who came up to me and said, you know, I know you're preaching and I'd love to hear you, but we're going to Disney World or the beach or somewhere else. Uh, and, you know, that's fine. I'm, I'm glad that everybody gets the break. Um, a special welcome to any guests that we might have in the house today. I'm not the normal uh, pastor. Pastor Robbie Murden is on vacation today. Robbie does not take many vacation days, so we're actually glad to see him uh, do that and uh, hope that he and his wife have a wonderful trip. Uh, my name's Chuck Barlow. I'm one of the lay leaders, along with Donna Rodemacher, the other lay leader who will have part of the service later on. Uh, and we're filling in because we kind of like to fill in with home folks when we can around here. Uh, if you will, if you are a guest, fill out the little yellow card that you should find somewhere just so that we have some information about you. Um, and if you would, look please on the back of your bulletin for a special announcement. Uh, the official call notice for the church conference. You all probably know, but please don't forget that on October 20th, uh, we have in the afternoon, we have the formal vote formal and final vote on whether or not the church will leave the United Methodist Conference. Now, there's something really important that you need to see here. We have been saying that the meeting is at three o'clock. The meeting officially begins at three o'clock, but our understanding now is that the way this works is, you gotta be here and have your ballot and be registered, which just means checking in, and they give you a ballot, and in the sanctuary by three o'clock in order to vote, okay? Our understanding of the procedure, which of course is run by the district superintendent of the United Methodist Church, is that the doors close at three, and if you're not in here, you don't get to vote. So as the bulletin says, please plan on being here maybe more like 2.30, okay? Give yourself enough time. Because if you're in line at three o'clock and the doors close, quite frankly, I don't know what happens. At Robbie probably does, but I don't. So just let's try to avoid that and be here at that point. There are other announcements that you can see and the um, uh, uh, events in the life of the church. Um, thank you for being here. Let's open the worship service with a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for everybody who's here today. We thank you for the beautiful weather that you've given us here today and this week, while at the same time we ask your blessings and your support and your love on those who are recovering from one hurricane and are now looking in the Gulf for another hurricane that might be coming their direction. Thank you for all of the blessings that you give us in our life. Thank you for our church. Thank you for this family. Please help us to worship well today, to say what you want us to say, to hear what you want us to hear. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, Kim.
Good morning. I am Jordan, for those of you who might not know me or have forgotten. Um, so today we're going to do something a little different for Children's Moment, okay? We are going to read a book. And it is called, Where. oh, there we are, Where the Wild Things Are. Raise your hand if you've seen this book. Has anybody ever read this book before? Yeah? Okay. Adults, anybody out there, Where the Wild Things Are? Anybody remember this, read this? Yeah? Okay, okay. Well, for those of you who maybe have forgotten or have not read this, you might want to pay attention to out there because Dad has it in his sermon as well. So for us, we're going to get to read it, okay? And then we'll talk about what it means. This is one of my favorite books and one of Julia's favorite books. All right. The night Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind. I don't know if y'all can see that, but he's nailing nails into his wall to make a fort. And another, chasing the dog with a fork. His mother called him wild thing, and, sa- and Max said, I'll eat you up. So he was sent to bed without eating anything. That very night in Max's room, a forest grew. Y'all can come closer if you want to come see the pictures. And grew. And grew until his ceiling hung with vines and the walls became the world all around. And an ocean tumbled by with a private boat for Max, and he sailed off through the night and day. And in and out of weeks, and almost over a year, to where the wild things are. Our first wild thing there. Remember, that's what his mom called him, a wild thing. And when he came to the place where the wild things are, they roared their terrible roar and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. Till Max said, be still, and tamed them with the magic trick of staring into their yellow eyes without blinking once. And they were frightened and called him the most wild thing of all. So he even scared the wild things and made him king of all the wild things. And now, cried Max, let the wild rumpus start. It's like chaos party. See, they're dancing. They're hanging from the vines. He's riding on all their backs. Now stop, said Max, and sent the wild things off to bed without their supper. And Max, the king of all the wild things, was lonely and wanted to be where someone loved him best of all. Then, all around from far away across the world, he smelled good things to eat. So he gave up being king of where the wild things are. But the wild things cried, oh, please don't go. We'll eat you up. We love you so. And Max said, no. The wild things roared their terrible roars and gnashed their terrible teeth and rolled their terrible eyes and showed their terrible claws. But Max stepped into his private boat and waved goodbye. And sailed back over a year and in and out of weeks and through a day. And into the night of his very own room, where he found his supper waiting for him. Who do you think left his supper there? His mom. And it was still hot. Hmm. So, at first glance, this book is probably just about a little boy who ran off into his imaginary world and got to play with wild things and do wild, crazy things things with these monsters, right? But let's look a little closer. So at first he makes some bad choices like chasing the dog with a fork and nailing nails into the wall to make a fort. And did his mom like that? Mm Mm-mm, there was a consequence. What was his consequence? 
No dinner. He had to go to bed without dinner, which hopefully none of you have had to do. But I bet some of you have probably had to maybe go to your room or go to timeout, maybe, or take a break or gotten a toy taken away from you, maybe something like that, because we've made a bad choice, right? So he goes into this imaginary land. He escapes, right? And he's having all this fun. But then what happens? He starts to feel lonely. He starts to want to be, it says, where someone loves him best. And he chooses to leave all the fun, to leave this crazy, cool world that he's created to go back home to his family. You think on that boat ride back home, he might have started thinking to himself, oh my goodness, I made mom mad. I hope mom still loves me. What if mom's not even there when I get back? You think he might have been a little nervous? Because he made her mad, right? He was in trouble. But what did he find when he got home? Dinner. His dinner, and it was still hot. His mom did not care that he had made her mad or that he was a little sassy or he was doing crazy things around the house. Yes, there was a consequence, but did she choose to still love him? Yes. Yes. So just like Max and his mom, when we do bad things in our lives, because we're not perfect, so when we make bad choices, can we always choose to go back home to God? Mm -hmm, we can. And will God always be there waiting on us? Yes. Yes. He will always be there with arms wide open waiting for us to come home and say, I'm sorry, God, please forgive me. And his love is unconditional, just like Max's mom and his hot dinner. Okay? All right? Let's talk to God. Bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you so, so much for a love so unconditional that we know that we can come back to you time and time again after making bad choices or even just doing something that we don't feel quite right about. Please help us to always remember that we can come home to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jordan. Um, let's have the ushers come down and we will take our offering for the day. If you are joining us online, this is a, a good opportunity for you just to think and remember about bringing the tithes into the storehouse. And uh, as Robbie says, put that check in the mail or go online. All right, pray with me, please. Lord God, we thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. We thank you that you give us enough to give back to your work and to your house, whether it's uh, whether we're like the widow that just had two mites or whether we've got more and should share. Please help us always to remember that it's our duty to tithe, that tithing helps us to keep control over the pulls of money and society in our life. And please help us as a church to seek your will in using this money and to use it well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beast of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the path of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, How majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Okay, so we do our lights of Christ. Let me get this situated and get my prayer book here. In our book this morning... We do have one glory sighting, so a light of Christ, and you respond with, thanks be to God. So the glory sighting is the cool weather. This is a light of Christ. All right, and then we have a few prayer concerns, and so I read those and say, in his mercy, and you respond with, Lord, hear our prayers. So obviously the death and the devastation of Helene, in his mercy. The approaching storm Milton, in his mercy, uh, a prayer for Jimmy Kendrick, in his mercy, and for Deborah McCants, which is Christy's mother, um, who has cancer and has been suffering lately, so in his mercy, Lord, hear our prayers. Um, so, as we go to the Lord in prayer, I've drawn on my usual source of John Wesley and some of my daily devotion prayers. So let us pray. So much, Lord, so much. We are blessed in so many ways, yet our world is full of trouble. We pray for all those who are ill, suffering, feeling grief or loneliness. You are the great physician. Our health and medical fields are so advanced. Yet we still have disease and death around the world. Give wisdom to researchers and pioneers as we seek to alleviate many of these things. We pray for all that are suffering the aftermath of Hurricane Helene and other related issues, devastation, destruction, loss of lives. Father, send your Holy Spirit to comfort and uplift, to sustain and persevere. We pray for the ongoing war in the Ukraine, for the violence in Israel. Father, I don't understand the reasons for conflict, but you do, and you have a plan. In these battles, protect the innocent men, women, and children that cannot fight for themselves or protect themselves. Help our country to be united and to know how to handle these foreign situations. Give wisdom to our leaders and hear our prayers for peace. We pray that you will reach out and move us on a path back to you. We have elections coming, and Lord, we need you to show us the best choice for our leaders. We pray for our church, for our pastor, for our staff. Give us guidance and direction as we move forward. Keep us in tune with your Holy Spirit as we transition and as we keep loving each member of our church family and of our greater community. To share a quote, living life God's way is supercharged when it's done in community with fellow believers. Father, I pray for all those worshiping with us today and I share this prayer. God, in all situations, at all times, you are good. 
Nothing compares to you, and there is no one like you. You are worthy of all glory, honor, and praise, simply because you are. Nothing can add to you, and nothing can take away from you. You are constantly powerful, kind, loving, just, merciful, and all-knowing. And I am humbled that I get to know you. Thank you, and thank you for the prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Thank you, Donna. Okay, I need to back up. How many of you have read or are familiar with the book, Where the Wild Things Are? Okay, well, that was a serious miscalculation on my part in developing this sermon. Let me go back just a little bit. So, in Where the Wild Things Are, it's a picture book, right? Maurice Sendak is the author. Little boy is bad. He's wearing his wolf suit. One of the most famous opening lines of literature and children's literature is, on the night when Max wore his wolf suit and made mischief of one kind and another. And he's chasing the dog with the fork and he's nailing things into the wall. Okay, and this is Max. Well, Max gets sent to bed without his supper, all right, uh, because mama calls him wild thing and his response is, I'll eat you up. And if you know my granddaughter, Julia, maybe we have read this book to her too many times because that sounds like her. Um, sent to bed without his supper and then either he has a dream or he takes a wonderful trip. He goes to see the wild things. They make him their king, but then he gets lonely. He comes home. And when he comes home, you know, as Jordan said, he, he's kind of worried about what the reception is going to be. He comes home. He walks into his room, and there's his dinner, and it's still hot, okay? It's a wonderful little book. It was published in 1963. In 1964, it won the Caldecott Medal, which if, you, if you're into children's literature at all, and I had a mother-in-law who was a children's librarian, and, and, and I, God bless her, um, we read constantly to, to all of our children a, a lot because of that um, I know what that's why I know what the Caldecott is the Caldecott is the be, is the award given to the United States for the best picture book of the year it's the the flip side of that coin is the Newberry medal the Newberry is given for the best story children's story every year um, so published in 1963 won the Caldecott in 1964 last year 2023, the BBC did a survey. They, they went out to 177 book experts from 56 countries and asked them, what are the greatest children's books ever? Guess what won? Where the Wild Things Are came in number one. Recently, within the last year, a computer programmer in Texas has created a database of 10,000 pieces of literature, all the adult books, children's books, plays, everything. He did this by taking 300 lists that people had done over years of best whatever, best children's book, best adult book, best books of the years. He compiled 300 of those lists and came up with a list of the 10,000 greatest works of literature of all time. Where the Wild Things Are came in at number 421. Out of 10,000, that places it higher than Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground, Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, Beowulf, A Streetcar Named Desire, and Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, to name about, you know, and about 9,500 other works. 
and Maurice Sendak accomplished this in 10 sentences. 338 words. Of course, the drawings tell a lot of the story as well. So why is this little book so lauded? Well, weren't you sassy to your mama at some point? You probably got sent to bed without supper or suffered a similar punishment. Didn't you dream of escape? an adventure, even if the adventure was probably going to be scary? Didn't you run away or want to run away? And in the end, didn't you get, come sick, get homesick and come home? And hopefully you found love waiting for you there. Children's books can help us explain a lot of complicated adult stuff. The idea of Christianity, for example, when I need to really explain just the basics of Christianity to a child, I read them The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. When I need to really help an adult understand the basic principles of Christianity, I give them a copy of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. You've probably seen it or read it, first book of the Chronicles of Narnia series, seven books. It's about a lion who is a symbol of Christ, a magnificent lion who has to sacrifice himself for a very bad little boy who gets himself into trouble. And by the end of the book, it's pretty obvious that it's an allegory for the story of Christ. I used it with my children. I've used it with, like I said, a lot of adults. It's children's literature, but it helps explain these complicated theological parts of being a Christian. When I want to help somebody understand the end times, the day of judgment, the apocalypse, kind of the other side of the coin, and I don't read it to young children, but when they get a little bit older or when I give it to an adult, I'll give them the last book in that series. You've probably never read it and they didn't make a movie of it. It's called The Last Battle. It is C.S. Lewis's view of the end of time as depicted in the Bible. And I gotta tell you, I've never read a more chilling sentence in any literature than when that magnificent lion, the Christ figure, looks to his helper and says, close the door at the end of the book. It's the door to heaven. It's the door that allows a relationship with God and the door closes. And characters that we have come to know and love, some of them, are left out in the cold and the dark and you find out why. When an interviewer asked Maurice Sendak, author of Where the Wild Things Are, why his children's books sometimes have this dark streak. He said, quote, children have to know it's possible things are bad. They are surrounded by people who love them and will protect them, but cannot hide the fact that there is something bad. And when a literary critic recently pointed out that in Sendak's books, and this is a quote of his, there are always wild things somewhere in there and very often, as in his most famous book, the children are the wild things. That sounds like the Bible, doesn't it? There is a creator who chooses not to hide the bad things from his children and often the children end up being the bad things. But in the end, there is love and protection. In the end, there is redemption. In the end, we get homesick and come home and dinner is there and it's still hot. So where do Cain and Abel come into this discussion? If you read the brochure today, the bulletin, we're supposed to be talking about Cain and Abel. Well, Cain and Abel is definitely not a children's story, but in a way, isn't Cain a very serious and grown-up version of Max? Let's read it. This is going to be Genesis 4, 
verses 1 through 17. I'm reading from the New American Standard just because it's my preference. I would encourage you to grab a Bible and follow along. Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 1. This is right after Adam and Eve have been cast out of the Garden of Eden. This is the very next thing. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Think there of a king putting his hand under the jawline of a subject who has knelt before him and raised him up like it's okay you can stand before me if you do well will not your countenance be lifted up and if you do not do well sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you but you must master it Cain told Abel his brother and it came about that when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? You see what they're doing there? The Hebrews love to do this. What was Abel? A keeper of flocks, a shepherd. So Cain is saying, am I the keeper's keeper? Do I have to keep the keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden. And I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign or a mark for Cain, so that no one finding him would slay him. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We could spend a long, long time dissecting this story. It really is one of the central stories around which Old Testament theology is built. We won't, but I'd like to point out some important points to you. So last night, I'm at my daughter's house. I'm playing with my granddaughter. And my daughter is standing up above me and takes a picture of me playing with the granddaughter. Shows me the picture. And I'm like, who is this dude with the bald spot on top of his head? I was like, who is that? Oh, wait a minute, that's me. When you see things from a different angle, because obviously I don't see myself from up here, Sometimes you see really different things. I want to try to do that to this story today. If I asked you what this story is about, you would say this story is about crime, a horrible crime, the first crime in the Bible, so to speak. This story is about crime and punishment. Would you say to me that this is a wonderful early example of the grace of God toward humanity? Probably not, but let's flip it on its head and look at it that way for just a minute. 
Okay, first, Cain does something to mess up his offering. We don't really know what it is, and a lot of biblical scholars say it's important that we really don't know exactly what it is. There are some ideas. Scholars debate about it. Put that to the side. He did something to mess up his offering, his attitude, his heart, what the offering was. We're not sure. But notice that that's not what Cain gets punished for. Okay, if you imagine God as a kind of arrogant king and somebody brings him a bad offering, maybe the guy's executed on the spot. Well, that's not what happens. God gives Cain another chance. God basically says, let's try this again and see if you can get it right. If you do well, your countenance will be lifted up. And again, remember that that vision of a king lifting up the head, gently lifting up the head of one of his servants. If you do well, your countenance will be lifted up. God doesn't punish Cain at this point. He gives Cain another chance. It's Cain's response to that second chance. That's the problem here. The murder. The punishment is severe, but not as severe as it could be. Cain is separated from the goodness of the soil. And remember, he was a farmer. He's made to be the opposite of what he was. Instead of a farmer loving his land, growing things from the land, getting the strength of the land, now he's going to be a vagrant and a wanderer. Cain complains that his punishment is too severe. Anyone who finds me now will kill me. Okay, so first, notice that God has not himself executed Cain. What are we going to find out just a little bit later in the Old Testament? What is the Old Testament punishment for murder? Death. But God doesn't do that here. He doesn't execute Cain. He exiles him, but he doesn't execute him. Second, let's talk a little bit about this mark that God gives Cain. We often think of it as a mark of shame, something that Cain had to bear over the years. In medieval times, such as when Beowulf was written, I mentioned a minute ago, They thought that Cain turned into a monster. And one of the monsters in that epic tale, Beowulf, actually is called a child of Cain. But that's not really what's going on here. This is a mark of protection. God creates a type of covenant that is going to apply to Cain wherever Cain goes. The mark was for his protection. And God said, anyone who kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him seven times. Vengeance will be taken by whom? God. For something that happens to Cain, the murderer. So even though Cain is exiled, he's sent off, he's cut off from the land, God creates this strange type of protective covenant with him. Almost as if God is saying, but I will still be there. Because there's nowhere that I'm not. So Cain is not executed, as would be warranted. He's given a mark for protection, a mark of his relationship to God in a strange sort of way. What is God doing here? I mean, this guy is a murderer. Well, I love this quote from a Swiss scholar who is named Walter Zimmerle about this story. He said, The dignity of human beings is disclosed in that they are called to answer for what they have done. Let me read it again. The dignity of human beings is disclosed in that they are called to answer for what they have done. God cared enough about humanity to try to set this right through punishment and relationship. Let me translate that quote into Mississippi for us. Did you ever have that coach or teacher who just would not get off your back? Right? For me, it was that offensive line coach who yelled and yelled and yelled and told my daddy, 
that by Christmas time, I'm going to think my first name was a cuss word because he always said cuss word Barlow instead of Chuck Barlow. But then he looked at me one day when he could tell I was just, you know, enough yelling. And he looked at me and said, boy, you better worry when I stop yelling. Because when I stop yelling, I have given up hope on you. You notice that I don't yell as much at everybody else? It's because there's nothing I can do for them. But I'm still yelling at you, and you better be grateful. That's basically what Walter Zimmerle is saying. God lifted up mankind, lifted up that countenance in a way by caring enough about what was going on to try to set it right. I'm not trying to make a hero out of Cain. Cain was a murderer and a particularly despicable type of murderer, a fratricide, killed his brother. But what we often fail to see in this story is God's response. And then Cain goes out and builds the Bible's first city. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, how does a vagrant and a wanderer who God doesn't care about anymore go out and build the Bible's first city. And if you read just a little bit further, you find out that Cain's descendants developed the management of livestock, developed music and musical instruments, and developed the ability to work with metals. Those things, those elements of early society and of a developing human civilization those things are given in the Bible in that chapter 4 to Cain's descendants. That doesn't sound to me like a people whom God has just written off into savagery and darkness. So maybe the most important thing this story tells us is not that a man should not murder his brother because you knew that before you read the story. But that God can and will show grace in broad and unexpected ways to a broad and unexpected array of people. Like Max. He was a sassy, bad little boy. But if you remember how the story ends, after he's sent to bed without dinner, travels to where the wild things are, tames them, and then decides to come home to his room, what does he find there? Supper. And it was still hot. Bad things are out there. God told Cain, sin is crouching at your door and you must rule over it. But at the same time, the grace of God flows through and around us in ways that we cannot begin to understand. Even for bad little Max. Even for Cain. And even for us. Amen. Kim, close us out with a hymn, and I'll send us forth with a dismissal. Our final hymn is number 405, Seek Ye First. Would you please stand? things about being in the choir is sitting back there and watching their faces. Am I doing this right? What's going to about to happen? Am I about to burn down the church? Can I set the plate down now? It's great. When I was growing up, 
after a baptism, our pastor would always say, Jesus said, and other sheep I have who are not of this fold. Let us go therefore and preach the gospel. As we go about our lives this week, let's remember the ones who are not of this fold. Let's try to present them with the grace of God through both our actions and our words. We hope that you have a wonderful week and we hope that you find your way back to God's house next Sunday. Acolytes, lead us out, please. Y'all go ahead. Thank you. Amen.